Good morning. I hope you all had a good day's sleep. I hope your headache isn't killing you too much. And if you don't have a headache, you're doing DEFCON wrong. <laughs> Sorry, but... So, thank you for coming, and let's get started. The name of the talk, as you can all read, is basically web server, botnets, and hosting farms as attack platforms. Um, if you expected a botnet talk, which I never give, this is semi-botnets. It's not really. The real name of this talk should probably be cross, completely cross-platform web malware. Um, it's not. <laughs> so let's just get started. Who I am? My name is Gadi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hey. Um, I do a lot of stuff that's related to botnets, fuzzing, all around really. And I work for an Israeli company called Beyond Security, a lot of vulnerability assessment. So let's get started. Regular malware. And guys, I'm really using simple definitions here, so if you're in the antivirus world, do not kill me, please. Just trying to get some basics going around. So. Regular malware, and this is the disclaimer so nobody can say I'm wrong, often. Okay, anybody can say I'm wrong, but you get the point. So, platform specific, meaning it's written first for the operating system, right? It would run on Windows, it would run on Linux, or whatever other platform you would like. So, that's the code, the binary code. It's compiled for that, whatever else you want to say. Then, it propagates. I believe. Most um, definitions would say most malware product propagates. Of course, not always. Trojan horses don't need to propagate, but you get a point. Uh, it, it can use. Sorry? I, I would actually like to hear that comment. If you can please share it with the rest of us. Oh, damn, I always wanted to say that. Okay. This is DEF CON, so I'm going to take my regular talk, insert a lot of fuck shit, asshole. Fuck, shit, asshole. So if anybody, no, seriously, if anybody, shut up. So if anybody <laughs> is offended in any way, I would honestly like to ask to apologize to you and ask you to leave the room. This is DEF CON and this is the way I'm going to speak and I apologize if you don't like me, but hey, if the world doesn't. Um, so vulnerability, so let's go through this, let's get started. So platform specific, yeah, propagates, use vulnerabilities, you know, web server, mail client, um, remote accessible service. And you can also use uh, social engineering or user gullibility as, or stupidity for DEF CON. And, you know, send you some email, say, hey, this is a really cool picture, you gotta click on that. And they would. Everybody knows that. And here are some things which are not always true. It propagates randomly meaning I can choose some addresses by some other means, but usually I'll just try and get as many samples out there as I can by blindly trying to infect everybody, and then some. And then usually, although there is no technological reason for this to be different, to not to work, it would affect desktop systems. I can infect the server, but mostly the systems will get infected by these viruses, malware, whatever you want to call them, or desktops. So web server malware, completely cross-platform, as long as there is actually a web server over there that supports scripting. It propagates by the use of Google, I'm sorry, I like Google, any search engine, but this is DEF CON. And, but usually these people use Google, and you can try searching uh, any search engine saying, powered by PHPBB. Actually now, Google has this thing that autocomplete, so just do, powered by and see the list of stuff that pops up. Really interesting. So you'd search Google, find some web application that you know has vulnerabilities, and blindly try to infect them. And these are in other differences. It propagates from a pre-selected genetic pool. Again, not always. There are other ways of doing this. You can just blindly go and try to attack different servers. Are you actually filming me? No? Okay, so that light is, has nothing to do with... In <laughs> Anybody has been here at DEF CON in 2005? Anybody gone to the Mudge talk? Yeah? No? 
It's much, there was no abstract. But let's go back to issue. And it affects servers, which means it can infect desktops. It's not very likely because most desktops should not run web servers. But it usually affects servers rather than desktops. So here is an example of some simple script um, that you just enter your, the string you're looking for in Google or some other search engines, such as MSN, Yahoo, etc., Yahoo, etc., and you find a ton of victims. Pretty, pretty neat. Could be done manually, but this is cool. In URL, by the way, very powerful search tool. So let's just look at what this means. Malware, bots, etc. So web malware is cross-platform, and so far, this is the interesting part, infected a ton, and by ton I mean thousands and thousands of web servers all out there already with, to be controlled. Not DSL machines, not dial-up machines. I'm not saying these botnets are gone, but web servers. And what the attack platform means, and again, if you don't remember, this is actually the name of the talk. Lots of web servers. Just consider all these co-location facilities, the server farms, all sync providers, unbelievable amount of servers with a lot of users on the same machine. And if even one of them runs some insecure web application, which we all know happens, right, and this is still kind of obvious, then the entire server is compromised. Just to be clear about this presentation, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff we already know. And let's just go over the stuff we already know. So there's been a lot of work about PHP shells. It doesn't have to be necessarily PHP. It can be ASP. Um, it can be written in, sh in parallel, as far as I'm concerned. And generally, very well explored. We all heard about them or should have. Inclusion attacks, or RFI, truly explored. And we have seen a lot of shells, actual shells out there, such as the R57 shell, or as Joe Stewart called it, spam through, um, which was very interesting. He showed actually an entire botnet that, all, that sends a lot of spam, about 57, I think, thousand servers, sending a ton of spam out there. Most of it was uh, um, shares, running shares, or stocks, or whatever you want to call them. And this was done purely by these web servers using R57 shells. And guys, if you want to talk, go all the way to the back because I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, you too, up in the front. OK, let me try this. Hello. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Hi. No, no problem. Can you share? What does the bag look like? Oh, hey. Oh, there is a reward for a bag. Anybody has a bag? Or is anybody a douche? <laughs> I don't care. I should have asked. So, other, I mean, PHP shells, okay, let's get started. PHP shells, five, I don't know if you've been to any of my talks before, five minutes, I just speak shit out of my ass. So, so you're leaving now. You only cared about your bag. It is bag. Okay, so PHP shells we know of, RFI attacks we know of, R57 shell, which was analyzed. We have seen these shells and actually looked at them. We know of them. So why am I talking about this again? And what is all this shit and how does it come together? So there is no other significant work or no work whatsoever done in this field up to a few months ago, which was February. And when the, the paper this presentation is based on was written, there have been some works by a guy named Jamie Ryden. I hope that's how I pronounce his name. And uh, about web aninets and web, web anipots, but nothing really significant beyond that. So, new work. There is uh, my work in co cooperation with uh, Kfir Damari and Noam Rathaus, which is web server botnets and server farms and attack platforms. And that was in Virus Bulletin on February. And of course, the great guys on the, uh, on the Aninet project with Know Your Enemy web application threats, these uh, web server threats um, with uh, shells was a very small portion of the work, but still very interesting. Good guys. And now let's talk about why this is even interesting, why this is new. So the injection. OK, I'm not talking about this is new. 
um, the injection. So let's actually read this. File inclusions are vulnerabilities. Okay, let's not read this. File inclusions are vulnerabilities in web applications which can allow an attacker to execute a script by including a file in an existing script. Okay, blah, blah, blah. There is an include command, think XSS, XS, right, cross scripting, only get entire scripts in, inside of just one instruction or something like that. And there are other types of vulnerabilities in post, in the URL, any type of vulnerability you want to think about that can also help you include code. And we can even upload file upload vulnerabilities. Anybody has file upload in, you know, enabled in their web application, blog? Not a very good idea. I had, I had mine, um, after a lot of discussions and arguments, we decided to enable file upload in a blog I hope to contribute to. And the very next day, we got compromised because apparently, somebody that, that actually secured the file upload issue made sure that people who reach the script can use it because the authentication test was commented out. You never know. Never trust upload from the web. So injection, you inject entire scripts into the current code. We know of that. And what injections look like? As you can see here, for example, you have whatever URL you've got, right? Which, and the, your, this is a URL because it has two URIs in it. And you basically use the script, you include some other, something that's going on from badguy.tld, malware.cmd, question mark, et cetera, and badguy.tld is basically where the bad script will be hosted, and you injected it. I mean, no matter what exact vulnerability we're actually talking of right now, it could be in WordPress, it could be in PHPVB. These are, this is how most of them look, and the resulting PHP code, actually this should be the other way around, is um, the resulting PHP code is above, but this is what it would look like. Get and the page, right, inside the include line, inside your script. And the interesting thing is, whatever this may look like, it actually causes your web server to act like a client. You go out and you download a script to your web server. Your web, your web server surfs the net. Now, unrelated to this particular threat of file inclusions, why should you allow your web server to surf the net? Basic rules. If we all follow the basic rules, we would have no problems. But this is where it all starts. So main types of web server malware. We've got a lot of scripts out there. Just consider, in the past, when you wanted to have control of the server, you would maybe have a shell. Maybe you have the computer connected to you as a connect back shell. But all these nice guys just came out and said, well, you know, there's this whole web thing going on now with web applications and maybe web 2.0. And why should we have to type? And when, especially when there is a port that's always open because it needs to serve the public, right? That's port 80. We can connect to the web server, type in a URL to a file we injected into the web server, and have a GUI, have a web GUI, a user interface for our shell. That's much cooler, isn't it? Again, nothing new there. So we have other types, not just shells. We have what I call foothold, foothold, uh, foothold grabbers, which are beachhead, basically. Hey, you got control, now start uploading stuff and do whatever you want. We have the remote shell, which is basically an elaborate compromise tool. Run this command, download that, upload that, do this, whatever you want to do. And then we are starting to get to what this lecture is actually about, which is the bot. If we can upload scripts to do whatever we want, and this would, of course, run with the privileges of the web server, why shouldn't we upload bots? These are servers, strong lines, strong machines. We can use them. And we can use them for different things. It could be anonymous messaging, right? Somebody's on the phone right here. Guys, if you want to talk, go to the back. The cool people sit at the back. I never sit at the front. So anonymous, did I just say I'm cool? That's deduction in the Newton way. OK, so um, you would have loved me. So anonymous messaging, you can spam. You can do defacements. I mean, consider where this all started. Anybody ever visit Zone H? Shut up, Warning Wood. So all these defacements out there, people figured, hey, why should we just deface the page? Are you, are you videotaping me? 
Can you turn off that blinking thing at least? No? Thank you. So why should we just deface these websites? You know, if it's the website for a Chinese government organization, or if it's a website for, for some club, biking club in San Diego, we should be able to do more than, with this. This is a resource. Let's use it. Yes. Web 3.0. Web 3.0. I don't think so, no. <laughs> at, at RSA, actually, somebody came and said, so what I've learned in this conference is identity 2.0. And I was, oh my god. Identity 2.0. So, Anonymous messaging, spam, defacements, and then, then let's make use of all of this. Let's use these web servers that are so easy to hack into and get a bot in there. Or not. We can do things that are much easier. Just upload some sort of a shell that lets us spam. And it lets us spam many different emails. And we can copy paste these emails in. Or not. Let's do something else. Let's, yeah, same thing. Okay, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's in a different language. This is interesting. Your email, reply to, etc. blah, 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 blah. And then, all the way over here, or I'm not going to run to the other side of the room now. <laughs> I'm fat. So all the way on the other side of the room, you'll have to figure it out for yourselves. Over there on the right, or over there on the right, there is load addresses from MySQL. Or for those not in the States, MySQL. So isn't that cool? Now this was actually the server I took this from. This shell connected to a server in France, which had a lot of remote databases on it of addresses. We're starting to see more advanced use now. So <laughs> let's look at this web shell. It's called C99 shell, and it has a ton of versions out there. I can't even begin to count them. Actually, I did, 33. <laughs> I didn't count last month, and there are a lot of stuff that the original authors didn't write and stuff like that. But as you can see here, we basically have a Linux machine running Apache. PHP 4.4.2. And this scrolls down. There are many other pages. And you can do pretty much whatever you want with that machine. It's yours. You own it. But let's stop now. Up to now, I actually did kind of speak out my ass and discuss file injections and PHP shells. Where are the botnets? So let me ask you a very serious question. Can somebody tell me what a botnet is before I continue? In most cases, violate other people's systems and add an actual application, add an actual application that, runs in the server. that runs in the server. For some purpose, you're just sending For some purpose, you're in a web page. Did you say gay something? No, what? <laughs> oh, a web page. I hear out my ass. Or taking over some other servers. Or collect the processes. Run commands. OK, let me define what the button is. Not that you're wrong, but you're wrong. <laughs> and the reason is definitions in the security industry are so much fun. We can define everything 20 different times for 20 different things, and we would always argue about it. The cheapest type of, well, anyway. What's a bot? Can anybody tell me what's a bot? A robot. What? A zombie machine. A zombie machine. What? Software robot. OK, defining what a bot is is something I'm still not able to do after over 10 years of working on it. Because consider, it could be just one machine that connecting to a command and control server being controlled. It could, but it could be 10 machines, I mean, if they're all from the same NAT. Or let's consider, if it's one machine, and it has 2, 3, 20, 200 different samples of bots installed, it could be 20 different botnets. Don't no, no, all, not all these botnets are always active. So how do we find a bot? For now, let's define a bot as a Trojan horse. Why? Because it is. The Trojan horse, and I'm not going to really argue about the definitions, is some sort of software, and this is taken from the something something FAQ on Usenet, if I remember it correctly. I'm completely ruining it right now. I, I read it 10 years ago. It is some sort of software 
that if you knew about it existing or some of the things that it does, you would not approve of it as a user. That's a basic Trojan horse. And let's add to that and say that most of these are remotely controlled, which means if you have a Trojan horse on some machine, you own it. It's completely compromised, it's yours. Yes, you can't kick it when it doesn't work, but it's yours. You can pop the CD open, you can spam, you can anonymize everything through it, and that's fine. And then you say, hmm, I have 10 of these. I have 20 of these. I have 100 of these. I have a million of these. How do I control all of these together? It becomes a little bit of a logistical problem. So let's help all these different Trojan-owned machines connect to me. That's not, ver not a very secure decision to make because I can know who you are. Well, let's say you do it right now. You choose some server with a simple protocol, for example, IRC, which is a chat protocol most of us are intimately aware with. And all these bots will connect there and say, hey, I'm owned, own me further. <laughs> and that master server would be called a command and control server, a CNC or a C2 if you're from the military. And that's what a botnet is to me, although it gets more complicated from that point on. And the definition is important right now because this is an example from about six months ago. This is a list of, not a very large list, about 540Ks of a text file. And I can't read that. But they basically list their shells as the attack URL. As you can see, for example, the first one was a university in Taiwan, and they had some sort of web application running. Over there you can see index.php, etc. And then you had the next one with the command.txt, which is the second URI, and that's the shell, sorry, that's the script they're injecting into that server. Makes any sense? Now, they are actually not listing the IP addresses. They're not listing the URLs. They are listing just the attack instructions. And this for them is a shell, which is very interesting. Um, new malware discovered. Okay, not so new anymore. This is the first, the second time I've given this pr presentation in public, and it's not really supposed to be extremely technical, so I apologize if anybody's concerned. It's more about the scale. And there was a new version of C99 shell out there. So you go and Google C99 shell, uh, C99 shell tool modified by Psycho with a zero, and you'll find quite a bit of those. And we had, up to two months ago, about 243 su unique samples. When I say unique, I don't mean somebody adding, um, this was created by Psycho at the entrance, at, at the footer, sorry, or something like that, small changes that somebody just took it and used it for their own ends. But completely different malware or variants of. So 243. I ran it against a few antiviruses, and at the time, only about 20 to 40 percent were on average detected. Half of that were detected uh, wrongly. Now, I don't want to think about antivirus on the web server, for the web server, but um, okay. So example three, and I'm quoting the guy because he was very, very excited. This on its own isn't new, but rather the way the program is delivered. By using PHP's evil function and evil function, <laughs> the new variant hides itself in Base64 and file encoded block of data, which is also encrypted. The characters are rotated so they don't appear to be in plain text. Now, I don't know how many of you ever have ever seen this happening, especially on bank websites, but Encryption, which happens on the client side, is not encryption. Any protection on the client side can be kicked or mutilated. But still, it's, it's giving us some, a lot of work. Instead of two minutes of reading the shell, we need to spend some two or three hours on it at times to just understand what's going on. But these guys finally noticed, hey, somebody is looking at us. Somebody realized we're taking all these different web servers and using them as bots or attack tools. And why is that interesting? So. Number two, which was this one, actually has a CNC channel, for example. And this is not as big as it used to be a few months ago, but you can Google search c100.php, and you'll find a lot of the different um, CNCs on the web itself through Google. And that's how it finds its command and control server on, Go on web search. I'm sorry. 
Um, which is something that we have not seen before that point, at least me personally, not on this scale. And it was passworded. Again, they're starting to notice that we care. Up until this point, if you searched for web shows, you could find two blog entries, a discussion on the incident, uh, incident mail list from 2005, uh, a discussion on bug truck from the early 2006, and some blog posts on Johnny Long's web server. Nobody cared. So why is this important? Let's look. Low cost hosting. You have two to three, sometimes five or six thousand websites per box. Any user can run any web application. Web applications, mostly in PHP, um, well, you know, open source, I availability, PHP stuff, very cool. PHP has a ton of vulnerabilities, and I mean, really? No, PHP is secure, no kidding. I mean, insecure, no kidding. So open source availability, PHP is PHP is bad security and ugly code. So com combining the fact that, yes? Same thing for .NET. The what? Same exact same stuff for ASP.NET. ASP.NET, okay. I never used ASP.NET. I never used PHP. But thing is, con just consider, if you want low cost hosting, you go and pay five bucks, seven bucks, 15 bucks, 20 bucks, I, more than that and you're screwed. I mean, why are you paying for that? And you have some virtual hosting machine. Oh, no, no, not even that. That will cost more. What am I talking about? You have a shared environment with thousands of other users. Zero security or close to zero security because it won't, won't pay for the provider to actually care about the security. It's really difficult for providers to care about security when they don't get paid for it. This is a problem, really. I'm, for once, I'm not being sarcastic. And then you share that server with so many different users or webmasters that love PHP. And how many PHP application vulnerabilities do we see on Backtrack per week until they started apparently filtering them? I don't feel very secure suddenly because if any of these websites is compromised, I'm compromised, the machine is compromised, and it's not good. So 3,000 users, any web application or script, will run with the permission of the web server. How do you run your web server? Anybody here who runs a web server runs it not as root? Really? Good going for DEF CON. Now, tell me, how many, once you're in the machine, how many local exploits are out there? Just privilege escalation for the Linux kernel. Ton of them. Once you have access, even if you don't have root, you'll get it. And if you don't, I mean, you usually will be able to do whatever you want anyway. You don't need that much of a high access level. This is not about quality. This is not about owning that server like in the old, good old days and discovering what's on it and doing stuff through it. This is about quantity. And then, when you have so many different servers, you have DDoS tools. Just imagine the idea. So what do we actually do about these attack platforms? Because this is really, really big. We can try and detect it. We can do VA scanning, you know, run. I hate saying that because it sucks, but you can try running Nessus. So, or something else that actually detects all these um, web thingies. And try and see if, hey, do I have any of these things on my box? Doesn't help you much, but hey, it's a start. You can look for known bads on a system. Guys, girls, I'm talking about antivirus for web servers. I am sure that by this time next year, we'll see one of the antivirus companies coming out with that. Patching, um, user responsibility. Do you want your user who pay, is paying five bucks per month to be in charge of patching their own web applications? When honestly, sometimes these web applications don't even have any patches out there. As you well know, a patch may not exist. Now, how much do you invest? Do you contact the user and then just one of them? Do you patch the site? Meaning, do you go and actually look for every web application on the server and patch it and try to keep up with it? Not, not very possible. And what about the server itself? Do many of these service providers even patch their own servers for OS vulnerabilities? 
You can do these things, they will help, but they are not perfect. They do not fit low-cost hosting. You cannot spend all that time. You can try and be reactive and treat some of these botnets, but honestly, some of what these have done, they have quietly patched their systems. They would choose just, for example, PHPBB or some other well-known web applications that are problematic and just patch these out off quietly without ever telling anybody. Not a very good solution. It worked for them to a limited degree. So there are some small things we can do to try and make this better. We can disable allow URL file open or URL include in PHP. There are some equivalents for other um, scriptable languages, but this is for PHP. We can try and run in virtual environment or true to users, but what's the cost yet again? Pretty high. Not doesn't really work. Don't allow surfing from a web server. My God, how many of us actually surf out of the firewalls to patch the checkpoint firewall or whatever firewall it is because we download it from the web? Any of us look at our policies lately? If we are not the people who do this, most firewalls surf the web, even if only to checkpoint or Juniper or whoever else you want to choose out there, Cisco. Not a good idea. The remote security and other such devices of application firewalls, IDSs, etc. They help, but pretty much useless in this situation, in my opinion. Some of us may disagree. I believe application firewalls are pretty much useless anyway, but never mind. And best practice is, what are, what are your own? Do you allow your people to surf out? What, what other things do you do? So, <laughs> quietly patch web applications, or at least the most known ones. I'm not sure that's a really good solution many people will like. It's the only thing that worked so far, but it's not very good. Now, let's boil it down. A battlefield with no escalation by the good guys is bad. And over time, when we did this research, aggregated attacker IP addresses 85% of the time were the same IP addresses. They did not use bots. They did not use proxies. They did not try to hide themselves. The same people from the same IP addresses would again and again and again over a course of a long time would be the same attackers worldwide. Which means there is an entire field out there that up to a few months ago and still just a few people are aware of this, which is unbelievable, are unopposed. Escalation, reactionary attacks, knee-jerk reactions are never good. But sometimes it's the best thing we can do. We can't wait for the civil bullet or whatever you guys want to call it. So do we want to start an escalation battle? No. Do we want this battlefield of web server botnets to be completely ruled by the bad guys? Do we want our web servers all around the world to be infected? And no, I mean, you guys are in security. Have you ever seen the attacker coming from the same IP address? Maybe. Have you ever seen them do it worldwide from the same IP addresses 85% of the cases of the time? When you look on your web server, at your web server logs, you look for many different things. Not for this. Many of your web servers, and I'm not talking about PayPal, I'm not talking about Amazon.com, these are very low, low hanging fruit vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities equal plain and simple remote code execution for web servers. And many of us are running these applications or basing our own applications on this. 85% of the time. We didn't even start the silly escalation war yet. Fuck! So we can compare this to SMTP. You know, in the, the open relay days, the spam, everybody was running around saying, close your open relays. This is not good. Guys, do something about this. Spam ruled. Anti spammers were few and far apart. This is pretty much where we are today. And the big guys don't have the money to cover it. And, they, and we can concentrate the problem to these providers. And there, in the news, there have been at least two very large providers of thousands of web servers, of each of them with that many websites, just this past year, who have completely been owned entirely in the news. How, much, how, many, how often do these things get to the news? So we started the Web Aninet Task Force. We originally, we called it the Web Aninet Project, but we didn't want to get in trouble with the Aninet guys, which are really nice guys. So 
We haven't really done much in the past few months because we finished our research projects and didn't really initiate any new ones. But we have 14 members. Some of them are the biggest co-location co facilities around. And what we figure is, if we gather this information, we can gather the malware. We can know about it. We can not just see what infects us, but around the world and prepare better for it. We can discover the command and control channels. All these buttons just move on to web servers. Hey, there you are, using the same old IRC technology. Ah. We can go to silly solutions that actually work to a limited degree, like IP blacklists. Without blacklists, as evil as some of us may think they are, the internet would not be here. No, the internet is not going to die tomorrow. The sun will shine tomorrow. We are not, this is not a cry wolf thing. IP blacklists really kept the mail servers alive because they can't handle the load. URL blacklist. I mean, that's the simplest thing we can get, we can figure. If this is an attack by URLs, we can just blacklist these URLs. S same as IP addresses, the same URLs are still being used. It's not as bad as it was a few months ago, but still. Web server antivirus. Oh, come on. They will rebrand the antivirus for this. It's like they rebrand that. McAfee keeps rebranding its IPS, so now they rebranded it for botnets. It may work. I didn't like the idea. So not saying anything bad about them. So you can join if you like and do some research. But let's talk about the impact. Just consider IIS botnets. Yeah. Linux botnets. It's a new ball game. It's not just, again, these are there and they're the main thing. All these DSL and broadband cable bots all around. They're the main problem, but this is a new ball game. And this is from obvious to not so much. IIS botnets, yeah, that's what I want to do. So defacements, spam bots, stolen databases. Stolen databases are pretty important. Just consider if you have access to the web server, why deface it? You can take the database. That's useful. And to be honest, defacements, I, I don't know if you noticed on Zone Age, but some of these go away. And the reason I noticed is that if, about six months ago, we started seeing forums, websites, legitimate websites that you would enter and as an, an unsuspecting user, you wouldn't even notice, but suddenly you see, hey, what is animated cursor zero day doing on my favorite forum? And why are they trying to infect everybody on the forum? That's the defacements of today. Not, I mean, unless you want to do something like, hey, you Israelis suck, or hey, you Palestinians suck, you know, regular defacement type of stuff that's going on, attack the web server, put in the malicious code, let users go on as usual. Just yet another way to infect people. This is all low level noise. We can't respond to all these millions of incidents out there anymore. Just when something really big comes along, do we respond to it really? So what it is about, why this is new, it's the scale, it's the cost, and the fact that the bad guys just do whatever the fuck they want. And again, knowing about PHP scripts is fine but there is close to no industry or community awareness of this. Again, it's DEFCON, I have to say it, fuck, hey. Um, hey, questions? Yeah. My main question, right, is why have the have the IS buttons? We did, we do, FIS buttons out there. He asked why do people not see IIS botnets, and I'm saying this is not a Linux problem. People do see IIS botnets, they are out there, you just need to look for them. You're not aware. Prove me wrong. Other questions? Yes. Yes. SSL for command and control. How oh, frequently? I have no idea I can pull a number out of my ass, but I honestly haven't really followed this for a while. We can continue the conversation a little bit later. Other questions? Anybody? Yes. Use botnets for legitimate purposes. Try. Distributed.net. Um, I don't know. Yes. What? Um, these are not published, but I have no reason to hide them. So, 
I mean, I have the I have the paper available online, the one I wrote for Virus Bulletin, same title. I did not update it in a while. No, sorry. Other questions? Yeah, anybody? Yes. I did not really distribute the, primary, the distribute the primary sources of attack by countries, but since the, does that matter online? Since when? I mean, yes, that's cool data, but I personally have not found it to be useful to see where the bots are located. What? Yes, same IP addresses. Sorry, I do not have that data available right here. Yes, any any questions? Thank you very much for listening, and I'm sorry I didn't say fuck enough. <laughs>